Okay, welcome back to Dr. B Teaches and the Seventh Generation Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. B, and I'm really excited to be here with you. It's Native American Heritage Month, and I'm going to be talking about a lot of indigenous issues for this episode. We're going to be diving into a topic that's really crucial in understanding Native history and the struggles of indigenous communities and I'm referring to the structure of settler colonialism. Now, when a lot of people think about settler colonialism, they think about something that happened in the past. And if that's you, if you're thinking of colonialism as something that happened, say, 500 years ago, then definitely stick around because I'm going to break down five facts that will challenge that idea and show you that this system the structure of settler colonialism is well and alive today and it's affecting and impacting indigenous communities across the United States, Canada, and I would even say uh, south of the border as well. So I released a very short video that I put up on my YouTube channel, Dr. B Teaches, and you may have seen it. It's like a three and a half minute video. And this is just an expanded version of basically all the things I talked about there. And I just wanted to talk more about it, give you a little bit more information. And of course, really dive deep into settler colonialism, because I really believe that understanding settler colonialism isn't just about learning history. It's not about learning what happened, say, when Christopher Columbus landed or uh, the conflicts that happened over the so-called Indian Wars. It's about recognizing its impact on the present moment here, 2024. And it's also about taking action so that we can interrogate the structure of settler colonialism and, of course, do better. And so challenging the structure is really important. But in order to do that, you have to really understand how settler colonialism works. So let's dive in. Okay, let's start with fact number one. Settler colonialism is not a thing of the past. It's an ongoing system, a structure designed to replace indigenous peoples with settlers. The methods might look a little different now because one thing that I try to explain to people when we're talking about settler colonialism is that colonizers, they put in place some type of system of control. But then as people challenge that system, of course, uh, the people in charge, the people who have the power, right, people who come to colonize will reshape the structure so that way it benefits them. And that's why I say it's an ongoing system. So it may look different than how it looked, say, 500 years ago when Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue and landed in the Americas. But the goals remain the same, control over land, resource extraction, and of course, pushing native communities, indigenous tribal issues really to the margins. And there's so much that goes into it, everything from stereotyping, which leads to the dehumanization of indigenous peoples, which of course leads to this idea that native issues really don't matter. And if you uh, take land disputes as an example, even today, Native communities are fighting to protect their sacred homelands from pipelines, from mining, and other forms of environmental destruction. And you can look at uh, what happened at Standing Rock and what continues to happen really all over. I think Oak Flat in Arizona is a really good example of uh, the ongoing struggle that tribes are faced with. I had a chance to visit Oak Flat recently and talk to some of our relatives out there. And, you know, that struggle is, is real. And you have this massive corporation, this mining company, this the largest mining company in the world, Resolution Copper. And they basically want to destroy this area that is not only sacred, uh, to the Apache, but it's central to their spiritual and religious outlook. But it's not just about land, it's also about policies that maintain inequality. Um, think about the chronic underfunding of native schools, healthcare systems, or the lack of clean water on reservations. 
there's just so many issues that are related to, again, the structure of settler colonialism. And these aren't just accidents. These are the results of a system that prioritizes settlers over indigenous peoples. So when you think about settler colonialism, I don't want you to think about something that happened a long time ago. Uh, I want you to think about a structure that we're all living under. It doesn't matter if you're, you're native or if you're non-native. We're living in a settler colonial society. The United States is a settler colonial country, along with places like Canada, uh, New Zealand, uh, Australia. These are places where settlers came and they decided that they were going to make a home here, but in doing so, they displaced literally millions and millions of indigenous peoples. Fact number two takes us all the way back to the roots of colonization, and I'm referring to the doctrine of discovery. So this legal and religious concept emerges in the 15th century, and it profoundly shapes the way European powers, European empires are able to justify genocide and the taking of indigenous territories. So let me break it down. The Doctrine of Discovery was a set of principles laid out in papal bulls, including one of the most famous ones uh, that was issued by Pope Alexander in 1493. So these decrees gave European explorers the right to claim any land uh, not inhabited by Christians. And of course, indigenous communities are not Christians, so when they encountered an indigenous community, they could basically take the land. Uh, essentially, if the people living there weren't Christian, if they were native, indigenous, the land was considered empty. And it's a concept known as terra nullius, empty land. And uh, in these papal bulls, they, they basically made it legal uh, to steal land from indigenous communities. So think about the implications of this. Indigenous sovereignty and humanity were entirely disregarded. Uh, Europeans could go throughout North and South America and basically plant a flag and tell the people there that this land now belongs to us. There was even a document that uh, was developed, and there's different versions of it, and it's re referred to as the requirement. And they would read it to in tribal communities who couldn't even understand the language and basically tell them that, you know, this land's ours and you are now um, under our control. And you guys can look it up if you want. Um, uh, the document's called a requirement. So the doctrine of discovery legitimized land theft, resource extraction, and the displacement of entire indigenous populations. And this is all under this idea of European Christian superiority. And it wasn't just a mindset. It literally becomes the legal foundation for colonization across the globe, North America, South America, even uh, places in Africa, Australia, New Zealand, wherever colonizers went, this doctrine followed justifying uh, genocide, uh, atrocities against indigenous communities, um, the sexual assault of indigenous women, and the erasure and the elimination of indigenous communities. And that's really what settler colonialism is. If you really want to boil it down just to one statement. It, it's the elimination of indigenous peoples. So even more shocking um, is the doctrine of discovery is not just a relic of the past. It's embedded in U.S. law. And you can look at the Marshall Trilogy. The doctrine of discovery is cited in the, the those uh, legal cases. So it's the foundation of of Indian law here in the United States um, gets cited in the Supreme Court uh, decisions in the 18th century, and its implications are still with, indi with indigenous peoples even today. But this doctrine hasn't gone unchallenged. Indigenous communities and legal scholars all around the world 
are calling for its repudiation, labeling it as a tool for oppression. Uh, even the church, I think uh, the most recent pope, he actually came out and after all these years denounced uh, the, the doctrine of discovery. So uh, there are people who are challenging it. Again, understanding the doctrine of discovery isn't just about learning history. It's, it's about recognizing how these colonial frameworks, uh, these policies continue to shape the legal systems and our politics today. That's why this conversation regarding settler colonialism is so important. You have to know, obviously, the history which we should all learn our history. We should all learn about the past, but it's important to to understand uh, how the past is currently shaping our circumstances here today in 2024. Okay, let's talk about the land back movement. It's one of the most misunderstood social movements out there. Some people think about the land back movement and they assume that it's about kicking uh, colonizers and, and settlers off the land, but that's not the case. Land back is about restoring tribal stewardship over sacred lands and ensuring indigenous communities have the resources needed to thrive. So the land back movement isn't about telling people to go back to their country of origin. That's what it's not about. The land back movement is about protecting treaty rights restoring real, true tribal sovereignty over the lands, over traditional territories. So land isn't just a, a physical space for tribal people. The land is tied to the culture, uh, the religion, spirituality, and the sur survival of tribal communities. So when sacred lands like uh, Bear's Ears are returned uh, to tribal communities, it's not just a, a political victory. It's about healing a culture that has been suffering under this system of control, oppression, and, and racism. So when you think about the land back movement, I want you to think more about um, a, a movement that is looking to right some of the wrongs of the past. But most importantly, it's really about challenging uh, the oppression that is built into the system of settler colonialism. And Lambeck also intersects really well with broader issues of environmental justice because tribal com communities have always been um, really great at not just understanding uh, the landscapes that they come from, but they've developed a way of living with the land uh, that has allowed for sustainability. And of course, if you look around all of our ecosystems, not just here in North America, but basically all over the globe, our entire biosphere is in decline. And I think one of the, the greatest contributions on the part of tribal communities is not just um, their understanding of the land, but how to live sustainably and how to have a deeper connection, not one that is built around profit and just making money off the land, resource extraction. So tribal stewardship often leads to, um, to better land and water protection uh, because Native communities understand and respect the interconnectedness of the ecosystems that they live on. So restoring land to its rightful stewards benefits everybody so tell people that land back, this movement not, doesn't just benefit tribal communities. It benefits every single human being on this planet because it's gonna, going to improve these ecosystems that are essential to the survival of all human beings. Fact number four is about the systemic suppression of indigenous cultures. This was no accident. It was deliberate. The United States federal government worked tirelessly to completely eliminate tribal cultures. Policies like the Civilization Regulations of 1880 outlawed indigenous languages, ceremonies, and even hairstyles. They even 
prohibited tribal communities from eating certain types of foods and harvesting medicinal plants. There was a movement to completely eliminate Native American culture, kill the Indian, save the man. That was the mantra. And I know some of you probably heard of Henry Pratt. He helped fund the first uh, off-reservation boarding school. And that really became the policy uh, across the United States was to uh, transfer the savage-born infant and introduce civilization to them. And so boarding schools were a tool for cultural genocide. But there were also uh, places where uh, Native Americans went to and never came home. And so there's unmarked graves all over the entire uh, United States and Canada. Um, There's Native children who've yet to be found and have yet to be returned back home. And some of these stories are really just difficult to even talk about, difficult to even um, uh, discuss openly because it's just so emotional thinking about what happened to these children in these boarding schools, thinking about what happened to some of our relatives in these boarding schools, the ones who did survive, uh, the physical abuse, the psychological abuse, the brainwashing, and um, the sexual assault. And, and it's really a horrific system. Um, but here's the, the thing, and this is what I always tell people, is that natives, uh, indigenous people, has always resisted. And despite everything, they kept their languages alive, traditions, ceremonies. Today we're seeing this incredible effort to reclaim some of, some of what's been lost. And one of the, the beautiful things that I see in a lot of communities is this push for language revitalization. There's all these really amazing programs all around Indian country where tribal communities are reviving their languages and practicing their ceremonies. So Native Americans are are proving their resilience each and every day. Um, the cultural suppression caused definitely a lot of intergenerational trauma, a lot of historical trauma, but it also sparked intergenerational resistance and all these amazing tribal people out there who are fighting each and every day to keep their culture alive and pass it down to future generations. And that's something that we need to celebrate, definitely, not just for Native American Heritage Month, but we need to celebrate it every single day because there's so many amazing people out there doing the hard work. What I'm seeing in New Zealand, Aotearoa, with the Maori, our Maori relatives fighting for their treaty rights, it's just so inspiring. And we have all these young people who are out there and they're doing the good work. And that just gives me a lot of hope, especially in these these difficult times that we're living in. There's so much division and there's so many people out there who feel just feel lost. But there's so many people out there who are doing the good work and they're really challenging these oppressive uh, colonial systems. Finally, let's talk about indigenous resistance. Native peoples have been resisting settler colonialism since day one, and they're still leading the fight for justice today. And that is one of the most important facts I want people to take away from this podcast is that tribal people are working every single day all over uh, North, South America, places like New Zealand, Australia, wherever indigenous peoples exist, there's these amazing people in communities who are resisting these colonial policies. And you think about Standing Rock, I know it gained a lot of attention. That wasn't just a protest. It was a movement that united indigenous communities all over the globe. People came literally from all over the world to stand against environmental destruction and the violation of native rights. And you consider the fight against the Keystone XL pipeline, uh, the fight to protect Oak Flat. And again, these are just a handful of examples, but there are communities who are fighting to protect their water rights, their treaty rights, to keep their culture alive, 
who are doing the hard work of resisting, again, these colonial policies and these colonial structures. And what I like to tell people is that indigenous resistance isn't just about native issues. It's about protecting the earth, standing up for human rights and challenging systems of oppression that harm each and every one of us. So it's not just about helping indigenous communities, obviously challenging and interrogating these structures of settler colonialism is going to help tribal communities, but it helps everybody because everybody's being oppressed in this system. There's this tiny little group of people, the 1% of the top 1% who have all the wealth, who have the majority of the power, and we all need to work together to destroy that type of structure because it's not working for people. It certainly hasn't worked for tribal communities, but it isn't even working for um, the so-called middle class or what we call the working class people here in first world countries like the United States or Canada. So when indigenous people are standing up for human rights and challenging these colonial structures, this is good for everybody. When native activists are leading these movements, they're showing the world that true leadership lies in the grassroots struggles. And I think that's something that everybody should know. And we should celebrate this and we should celebrate the people and uplift these leaders who are out there doing the hard work. Because there's just so many amazing people who um, are not famous, they're not politicians, they're not wealthy, but they're doing the hard work each and every day to make our lives better, to protect the well-being of our our lands, our homelands, um, and these amazing ecosystems that have sustained life since time immemorial. And so when Native people resist, It really, truly is good for everybody. So there you have it. Five facts about Native Americans and settler colonialism that everybody needs to know. Remember, it's not just about learning history. It's about recognizing the impact of these colonial structures today and taking actions to support indigenous communities. And I know that's one of the questions I always get. How can I support? And I always tell people it starts with you educating yourself about tribal sovereignty, of course, supporting indigenous-led movements like MMIW, the protection of sacred sacred sites, the land back movement, and amplifying indigenous voices. If you're in a position where you're able to do something like bring a tribal community member in to talk about their issues, to talk about their culture, and to share, I would encourage you to do so. And of course, if you enjoyed this episode, feel free to share it. And I really enjoy talking about uh, these topics. I know they're kind of difficult and the history is really, really ugly, but it's important for us to challenge these oppressive systems. And of course, to support the people out there doing the hard work. And there's so many incredible people who are just doing amazing work, not just in their communities, but they're doing the amazing work for all of us. So let's keep this conversation going and work towards a better future. Um, Of course, you can follow me on Instagram and on TikTok. My Instagram is 7 Podcast. My uh, TikTok is Merciless Savages. And of course, Dr. B teaches on YouTube as well. I try to hit some of the the major platforms. My podcast streams on Spotify and all the other major uh, podcast platforms as well. And if you have any questions about anything in the video, if you want book recommendations or something that you want to know regarding uh, settler colonialism, our Native American Heritage Month, you can leave a question in the comment section and I'll do my best to answer it. And uh, you could always reach out to me as well, again, through Instagram, um, or you can follow me on TikTok and you can reach out to me through TikTok as well. But this is a seven generation podcast. I really appreciate you all listening 
Uh, don't forget to subscribe to my channel on YouTube, Dr. B Teaches. And like I said, feel free to share um, all my content, really. I've um, been teaching for over 20 years now, almost 25 years. And this is really my passion. This is what I love to do. And don't forget, November, Native American Heritage Month. Let's celebrate all those uh, indigenous communities out there just doing the great work. Till next time, this is Dr. B. Later.